Hello, I'm NovaSC, and I'm going to be talking you through my five top tips to win any StarCraft 2 team game. And as a little introduction, I'll just show you why you can possibly trust me. I'll click on my name here. Uh, this is just as a new season start, the, the d day straight after, so this is a really bad time to do this, but still, I can still hover over this quite nicely. And I have achieved team in team games master 26 times, and that's mainly through just playing 3v3s, so that's master for quite a few years. Um, sometimes without playing many games of playing only a few, but I guess once you're a Masters it's, it's sort of okay staying in there as long as you win a certain amount of times. But anyway, yeah, I have got some experience under my belt. I hope you can trust that number that right there. I'll, uh, I have achieved, not that one, uh, uh that is, I have achieved one season like, uh, a year and a half ago or so. Um, I actually tried to get a high rank, so there we go. That that will be. I got a, a rank three in three v threes one season. That doesn't actually tell you a huge amount, but still, yeah. I, there's there's lots of master t logos there, so I have played quite a lot, and I have achieved master a lot of times. So now I'll move on to my first top tip, and this is quite an obvious sounding one, and that is think about your teams. So to demonstrate this point, I'm going to be jumping in, well I've already jumped into the very last game I played, literally the last game I played, and because any old game is a pretty good example here. I am here, I am a process player on this occasion, I often play random, I, I, I pretty much always play random when I play team games, just because it's for funsies, isn't it? And uh, I'm with a Zerg, a Zerg, a Terran, and our opponents have exactly the same race sort of layout as with two Zergs, a Terran, and a process themselves. So what I was saying here, for my first point, is you really have to be thinking about what your team is doing, their races, what they can possibly do, maybe their skill sets, things like that. So I'm going to go through each of those. So firstly, their races. So I'm Protoss in this case. So we can think this, we can simplify this down to fast things and slow things. Usually, um, I think that's the most important point to take away for team games because team games mobility as I'm going to be iterating lots of times throughout this video mobility is really important because maps are so big fast units really do have a big advantage so as the the race with the slowest units process I really need to be thinking about the speed of our opponent my my allies so Zerg oftentimes fast units muters Zerglings etc even roaches are pretty damn fast with the, with their speed upgrade there's another Zerg. So two Zergs, big emphasis on speed here. And there's a Terran here. So the Terran can be picking the slower units, which get faster, or such, um, that being the bio. So Marines and Marauders get faster as throughout, as throughout the game, but they're initially slow, so we need to think of them as the slow units. Or we could be going for the or Mech, which is initially really fast, but then slows down. So that's Hellions into tanks and things. So we can, we can assume that as fast just for now because we're thinking about the early game, just just for now. So in this sort of setup, I really need to be thinking, hmm, allies are fast, so I need to be making fast units if I'm going to be helping, because if I don't make fast units, if I make marauders, oh sorry, if I make immortals, zealots, to a lesser extent stalkers as well, and sentries, then my army is going to be a lot less mobile than my um, allies, because they could, be, they could be off gallivanting around the map, attacking here, attacking here, getting in here, all over their, their grills in this location, attacking, ooh, getting around here, the the, the mouse here, um, the mouse pointer indicating the actual speed of the Zerg's units here. Whereas, um, my units with the Immortals are going to be a bit, ooh, a bit slow, um, not going to be able to dart about back and forth, they're going to be put, holding our allies back and not really helping, there's just a bit of, bit of a waste. So, in this case, Probably better for me to be making fast units, or you're not going to have many people recommend this to you, but I sure as hell do recommend it. In this sort of cases, you can turtle if you are the slower player. You can make up a strong army if, you, if you're not opting to make a fast army. You can build up your slower army, you can expand, and later on, your army is going to be a hell of a lot stronger than your opponent, than your group, your, your ally team, and you can just roll over your opponents assist your allies in, in that effect. You can even um, contribute now by 
helping her um, assist in dealing with harassment, dealing with counterattacks from your opponents, that sort of thing. And equally, if I was Zerg, if I was Zerg, um, all my opponents were 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 um, slow. I might want to be uh, favoring towards some um, mobile units. That way, we can get map control, map vision, um, see what's going on. We can attempt to punish some bait, some fast bases because if a no, if a team has no players with mobile units, then that is a big disadvantage. So let's just play this out a little bit. Good luck, high five from one of my allies. And we'll just have a look at what these opening build orders are. So. As I said, what our, opponent, our opponent's skill sets, their decisions, they're all really important as well as just what races they're making because they could be Zerg and still go for a slow army because they're, they're fucking crazy, possibly. I don't know, you don't even know, do you? So, uh, <laughs> uh, lots of drones coming out from this guy. A relatively fast pull from this dude. <clears throat> and I think that's an expansion going down <clears throat> from, this, from this fellow. That's a gas. And the barracks, that looks like a tech sort of play. <clears throat> That's a pool. Going for speed, this guy is. That's a mobile army. What's this guy doing? Acknowledging what our opponent's doing, but that's that's for another tip, my friend. That's that's for another tip. And this fellow here is also gonna go for some speed. So for the, at this point, we can see all the things that our, our allies are doing. So speed, speed, but very mobile. Um, from this Reapers, that's mobile. Um, goodness me, so much mo mo mobility here. And I am Protoss sitting on Stalkers, which are expensive and clunky, and they're, they're sort of fast, but if you lo lose them, you're sort of screwed. So they're not really a thing you want to be uh, using without any upgrades. Um, so in this situation, I'm seeing all the speed from my opponents, from my I'm sorry, from my allies. I'm gonna have to opt to go for a Stargate or something like that to to speed me up, or I'm gonna go for a big army. So let's see what happens. I should probably disable the text or something. I don't know. I don't even know how to do that. To be fair, <clears throat> early on to contribute to the aggression which is coming on. I'm going to be contributing some mobile units. Stalkers, very mobile in the early game. But as I said, they're a bit clunky and expensive, so into the mid-game you don't really want them. So they're not going to be something I can just keep making unless I make invest in Blink, but that's not something I really want to be going for. <clears throat> and there we go! This is my tech choice of choice. Choicing choices. I've got three gateways up here. Going straight for a robo and straight for a bay. That's a six minutes. This is ridiculous. This is before an expansion, but remember, this is not a one versus one game. This is a team game, and you have lots of allies which have expanded. Don't worry about economy so much. What's the point in having loads of economy if you don't if your units aren't adequate for dealing with your opponent's um, aggression? There are four opponents we're against here. They can get a shit ton of units. You really don't want to be spreading yourself out too thinly if your opponents, if your allies, have been making mobile units which aren't as effective in a strap engagement. So, big old units. Robustic Bay here, going to be making some Colossus. Actually, for a Terran, this is similar for a Terran. A Terran could opt to be going for lots of Hellions if they're going for Mech. <clears throat> or they could be, they could opt to go for lots of tanks. And tanks are often the decision if you don't think you'll be able to uh, make those Hellions pay off very much. So yes, Turtling. Sounds a bit stupid, but in team games, very good option. You'll see how it plays, plays out. I really want to be moving on to the next tip now, guys. Come on. Come on, don't blame me for speeding up this stuff. That overlord got away, that's, that's a great old overlord there. So these big, fast um, skirmishes going on here with Banelings, Zerglings. There are a couple Stalkers, my opponent's done the same sort of thing as me it seems. But I would have no help, help contributing to these fights. If I contributed, if I spent all my money on like tw 12 Stalkers, this would die so fast, these Zerglings. And this is the counter-attack, which is bound to happen if, you, if um, my team is expanding. And I move in, a Colossus, Clever Terran has made Hellions, and the Colossus is just putting in work. This is just a massacre. He tries to focus down the Colossus, I just micro slightly. Bit of a miss micro from my opponents here, but still. And that's racked out some mighty kills. 13, 13 so far, damaged even more. 
that was a successful opening. So I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> I'll move on to the next point. Yeah, so what to take away from this is you really want to be complimenting what your opponents or your allies are doing. Sorry, opponents and allies. I really should distinguish those properly. Uh, you should really be complimenting what your allies are doing. So if your opponent's making really fast mobile units and going for aggression, if you're not doing, if you're not producing units which uh, help them out, you really want to be doing something which does. And what does help them is defending their base, building up later for a big attack. Or what I didn't show you here is producing something which can keep up with the mobility such as uh, Phoenix or uh, Oracles, but a lot safer is the Colossus in this situation. So I'll move on to my next tip. So my next tip is maps, and to help explain this I've brought up all the Blizzard maps. And I'll go talking through a first a, a, a few of these. So my first choice is Deadlock Ridge. Let's have a little look for that one actually, let's have a little fight. There we go. Ugh. I'm picking uh, Eight-player maps. Even though this is, these are general techniques for any team game, but it's going to demonstrate it a lot more clearly with these big maps. So I hope you, I hope you don't mind. So Deadlock Ridge. If we analyse this map a little bit, we only want to take a couple things away from this, and this, and that is, is this map big? <laughs> is it small? Is are all the allies together? Um, are they far apart? So, firstly, the the map is, I mean, it's it's moderately big. I mean, it's okay. The rush distance—it's—it's—it's it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, sort of long. But there are much longer maps. What we really want to take away is from this is that all the players—they uh, share either of these two ramps, and these ramps are very close together, which means that we can group our forces up really easily. So, in the event of a rush from our opponents, um, our our units can all group together to help defend. So, there's none of this four players on one stuff. Because at the very least, it's going to be uh, four players on two. But yeah, the other player, the other team can group up and join, which means, which means, we can get away with making relatively slow armies on this map. In fact, with a slow army, we don't have to move that very far to get to this very central location, which gives us a big advantage on this map, because of all this um, high ground um, area with the, with the with the line of sight blockers here. So, what we can take away from this is that slow armies are going to be fine on this map. We can get, we can make tanks, we can make colossus, all going to be good. I've seen people make void rays on this map in mass quite a lot with annoyingly good success. So, yes. Let's move on to our next map. Old country, old country. I've written it down, I have to keep looking to keep looking across to figure out what's going on. Uh, old Country, this is another four player map. It looks like a... It doesn't look like a... I'm um, sorry, 4v4 map. It looks doesn't look like a 4v4 map. It looks more like a 2v2 map, doesn't it? It looks more like player spawns here, player spawns here, player spawns here, player spawns here. Something like that. But no, it's actually like a, a double map. There's a cut in the middle here. Two players here against two players here, two players here against two players here. This is a really cool map. I haven't seen anything like this before in, a, in the 4v4 map called before. But yes, what we can take away from this is that again, two players joined up like this, two players joined up like this. If we consider it a map against a map, so two independent maps, then making a slow army could could work out. It could work out because we're close to our allies, we can help them defend each other. However, this is in a TV2 that would be fine. However, this is a four-player map. Remember. It's not just ever going to be independent, no matter how good, it, how much it looks like it's two players, it's two independent games. There's always a way for you to help out. So going for a mobile army, going from Reedons and Marauders can be very good. Fast armies in this map, even though it seems probably counterintuitive considering how close these you are to your allies here. If you make fast armies, you can help out on the other side. It's more of a this side against this against these two and these two independently, which gives you a big advantage in that case. So. Always where you can. Uh, fast armies where you're separated from your opponents, when you're far away from some of your sorry, when you're far away from some of your allies. <clears throat> so, next, next, gotta find my little notes. High ground. Let's go have a look at high ground. Let's have a look at high ground. What's high ground? There it is. Let's have a look at that. 
So on this map, again, it's very wide, it's very big, and the allies are a long way from each other. So I've seen a lot of people play slow styles because obviously we can turtle really nicely like this, or like um, like this, defending these two um, natural bases here. But unfortunately, this isn't a 2v2v2v2, this is a 4v4 in this case, so if this was 2v2 you could probably get away from going for some slow armies here, but you need to worry about your opponents because if 4 players attack your 2 um, allies here, you're gonna die. If one of your allies dies you're in pretty bad shape, so going for a fast army here, so that you can help out, you can come to the rescue and make it more of a united effort, that's definitely the choice that you're gonna have to go with. Next, Celestial, Celestial, Celestial Bastion? Celestial Bastion, I think that's what, how that's pronounced. Let's have a look at this Bastion, I think that's how you spell that. Okay, so this map has a really bad image as its, uh, <laughs> as its screenshot, but let's try and analyze this. So this is a massive um, fortress here. A fortress against a fortress. The rush distance is quite short. Most of the map is these expansions along the side. So what we can take away from this is a contrast to the previous maps that I've been showing you, which is the reason I picked this one out, is that everyone's together. There's no one over here that you need to worry about defending unless they've taken a unless they've gone for a hidden base, which is just very annoying of them. Um, there's nothing nothing you have to worry about. Your slow armies, they aren't gonna take a huge amount of time to get to your opponent because of the rush isn't so short. So slow armies like tanks um, Broodlords when you get there. These, these are all units which are going to be very good on this map because you can just waltz up to your opponent, you can just just skip over there and deal some, deal some real hurts without worrying about leaving your bases back here too undefended, so yes, yes, yes. Think about how close you are to your allies always in team games when you're making decisions about what units you want to be making. So that brings me to my third point and that is races. And I've already talked about races a bit in the first topic that I talked about, uh, but now let's talk about the races of our opponents and how that can shape our decisions about the composition, what we do with our units, etc. So, in this random map I jumped into, just a replay, um, it qu by coincidence we have exactly the same setup for both players, for both teams. There's two Zergs, a Terran, that's a Protoss, <laughs> a Terran and a Protoss, so two Zergs, Terran, Protoss for both teams. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, useful information we can gather from this. Well, we know the races, obviously, but um, there's not a lot of things we can take away from this to help us out, because what we're really looking for is a, race, a whole race to be missing, which is always going to be the case in a 2v2, or we really want um, all of the same race, which is very unlikely, especially in a 4v4. So if we have, for example, all of the same Zerg player, or all Zerg players are gonna, we're on our opponent's team, we can fairly reliably do a X versus Zerg build as if it was 1v1, 1v1. So it would possibly need some sort of a tweak because maps are often a lot bigger. Games play out a lot differently in team games. But yeah, you can often go for things like a, quite an extreme example. Um, a process player could often go for a wall off with a forge and cannons against all Zerg players and expand as long as there's no gaps in that wall. Whereas against any other combination, if there were Terrans and Protosses in that combination of um, opponents' races, then there's going to be Marauders and Stalkers which can shoot down that wall, and that's not going to work out very well at all. Let's think about if a whole race is missing. So, if every player is not a Zerg, as is often the case in 2v2s, then that means there aren't going to be spe Speedlings early on, there aren't going to be Mooseless early on, if there aren't if there's a whole team without any um, Terrans, that means there's not going to be any mines, so you don't have to worry about mine drops and things. Uh, Speedling expands where you get lots of Zerglings, don't have to worry about mines going off. And against, if there's no Protoss, no DTs. So these are things that are really going to be helpful assumptions in your gameplay. So you don't have to worry about getting uh, detection at certain times because, you know, there can't be DTs, etc. So that's quite an easy point for me to talk about. Um, I hope you do take this into consideration, because I see a lot of people not taking that into consideration, the races of our opponents. If um, What I like to do a lot, if I, if I don't see any um, Zerg players, if I'm only against Terran and uh, Protoss, and I'm a Protoss player, 
Uh, I like to move out my stalkers really early on, get three stalkers and poke up and try and do all a bit of damage because without worrying about any speedlings, there's nothing faster than stalkers in the early game. So it's really useful information knowing what races your opponents are. So next I'll move on to my next point. So now you join me in another random replay where I'm going to demonstrate my fourth uh, top tip, which I've been very becoming calling topics, uh, points, other things probably. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't care. I uh, my fourth tip is mobility, and I'm reiterating this. I've talked about it already quite a lot, but it's just so damn important on these massive maps that you have to play on in team games. So initially, this game as um, in this situation, I'm playing as a Protoss. Um, I've made lots of stalkers, and then I've seen from, from out of what my opponent's doing. Oh, I didn't see this. Goodness me, that's a lot of uh, proxy marines. Um, I saw uh, what my opponent was doing, and it wasn't um, aggressive. I think what happened in this game was we scouted out uh, this. I think that was probably a really fast pull. That would explain why this ex expansion has only just gone down. And yeah, nothing really came of it. So I made all these stalkers. Not much really happened. Now the Obvious next choice would be to maybe get Colossus or something up, don't know, expand. But remember these team games, uh, mobility is so very important. A better choice would obviously be to go for Blink. Or in this case, we're going to see me, me go for a, a Warp Prism. So always go for the most uh, mobile choice within reason. So, like I said earlier, if you can't match the mobility of what your opponent's doing, then it's probably best to turtle and do something helpful later. But, in this situation, I did have already have a Robo, the most mobile option, which is going to keep me on, um, up in my opponent's grills, um, is going to be to get that Warp Prism and go for a little bit of a poke. Now, always um, going for these sorts of uh, harassment plays in team games is really helpful because there's more weaknesses in your opponent's defences, so there's... This player seems to not be here, that's great. Um, Oh, this is a really bad example, I'm sorry I picked this one. I just picked it randomly. Um, yeah, there's going to be more more bases for your opponent than in a uh, 1v1 because there's more players. So there's more weaknesses for you to exploit. So when you go for these sorts of fast mobile armies, <laughs> these fast mobile armies, there's more things you're going to be able to hit and it's going to be a lot more effective. So like here, unfortunately, um, my allies is, isn't reacting particularly well either. But going for this mass reaper play is a really good build, especially in uh, team games in, in a 4v4. Because you can dart in, focus down one player, and like, that did quite a lot of damage. Unfortunately, you can't have a worker's kill tab in 4v4, which is a shame. But I'm here, um, I killed off that whole base because they didn't lift it up for some reason. Who knows why? I think the guy might have actually not. No, he did leave. They could have lifted it up. They're just a bit mental, these guys. Um, Reapers coming in. So these are really, really aggressive compositions. Um, Marines, they're going to have the problem of being slower than the rest of the army uh, we have. Like, I have Stalkers. Very good in the early game. And I'm also going to be able to kite. Another reason why um, mobile armies are going to be even better is because there's so many players, even if the, there's this massive advantage at one point in the game with a slow army which can go around just knocking players off. There's, there's more players in the game than just an ordinary game than a one versus one. So even if they do kill off some players, mobile armies like this are going to be wearing the enemy down and um, this team can still win overall. Like It seems pretty, pretty damn uh, dire at this point in the game. But over time this can be worn down because I have stalkers, I have units which outrange. And yeah, unfortunately I think I probably lose this game, so it's a really bad example, but still. The advantage of going for that Warp Prism early on, really helpful. And another reason, that's another reason you'll find Mutalisk being ridiculously annoying and effective, as well as Phoenix. I've already um, uploaded lots of videos on Phoenix and how very good they are in uh, team games, because the more mobile, just the better. Usually that's just that's just as simple as that. You know, you're going to be able to focus down the players that are the weakest. You're going to be able to isolate units. And because there's more players, there's going to be more 
vulnerabilities, there's going to be more units just trickling across the map that you can pick up and kill. You just have more time for these fast units to be effective. So that, with a marvellous bit of editing, has brought us to my fifth and final top tip, that being transitions. Now that sounds sort of ambiguous, you don't know what that's going to mean. A bit vague, but I've brought you into this map, I'm not actually going to show you the game, but this map's going to show you exactly what I mean. So, if we look at this map, in a normal one versus one game, each player's going to have, say, six expansions, five or six expansions that they can choose from to expand to. And the game can go into the late game very nicely like that. But if we look at this, which is a lot a lot less maps are like this, but this is an example of how maps can be. We have seven expansions per team and four players. So that's less than two expansions per each player. So we're not exactly going to get into the late game situation here. Even though these games can often... Not in this case, but even though these games can often run in on very long, uh, 4v4s can last, say, a 30 minute game, is sort of normal. Even though these games can run on a long time, players aren't going to get up to very high economies, economies, which means a very easy mistake to make is transitioning too fast, because we can see that the time is 20 minutes into a game, and then think, oh, it's probably time for Tier 3, Broodlords, Battle Cruisers, whatever. Well, unfortunately, you really have to do look at the economy you're on. With one exception, and I'll come to that. So, when you're on one mining base, as a general rule, uh, there's no real need to tech up just yet to tier 2, usually. Usually. I mean, obviously you can get away with teching up fast. Um, in some cases, often... What you do doesn't have a huge amount of impact on the game, especially in a 4v4. But, yeah, you're usually better off just sticking on the tier 1 tech, unless you're doing it for a very good reason, for example. Seeing your opponent has made only Zerglings and then going for the Colossus. I mean, that's a pretty cool that's a pretty cool thing to do. I like that. And then when you start moving on to other bases, you want to start teching up then. And if you're... Base, if you're um, if you get harassed, your worker count goes down. You want to probably start producing the lower tier units again. If you can't, if you just make a broodlord, because you're on two bases. If you're on two bases, most of your drones are dead. Even though it's 30 minutes into a game, if you make a broodlord, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference because your army's just going to be, it's going to be a broodlord. I mean, that's not going to do much, do much damage. However, keeping this topic really short. You do have to remember that you're playing as part of a team, so transitioning to units which do a lot of splash damage, that's often a really good choice. So even on one base, sounds like a, a heap of, co of contradictions here, but if, even if you're on one base and you see that your opponent's, produced, you, your opponent's army has a lot of individual units, so like I said, lots of zerglings, lots of marines, Producing units very early with splash damage is going to pay off a lot, because think of the amount of damage that High Templar deal if there's just a massive swell, like a massive ball of four players' units. That's going to be really, really effective. Even though even though you may have only three or so High Templar, that, that's just going to pay off pretty damn fast. <clears throat> Another thing to think about is um, not just your opponent's army going to be big, um, your ally's army is going to be big your team's army is going to be big, even if your economy is low. So, you could be on, on on just one base, really late into a game, and your opponents, um, your allies are carrying the game quite a lot with a huge army. If you contribute just a few tier 1 units, which have minimal upgrades, you're not going to make too much of an impact, but if you use the fact that your, oppo your opponents and your allies' armies are quite big, and and use that as an advantage, a source of like a meat shield, as have that whole army of up to three players as a meat shield for your army, then you can start doing things like, hmm, well, I don't really have to worry about defending my own broodlords now, because my ally has this massive mech army, for example. So, let's just make only broodlords on one base, because, because that's the best way to help out our allies. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do much on your own, you can't exactly bolts your army across the map because you've got no support, but you can have it um, add to your opponent's army, which is a really good transition to make in 
uh, team games and it does actually work out really well. Unfortunately I have deleted many of the things out of my repos folder recently so I can't find a good example. However, in the future I hope to include a link in the description so that you can see a video of me using just a few units with a low economy and contributing um, as much to the game as those of greater economies than my own. So that concludes my video. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit of a rambling session, lots of talking, lots of words being bombarded at you, but I hope at least one or two people have taken something away from the video and um, will be able to one-sidedly crush, destroy, dominate uh, team games, raising to masters from bronze of course, within two to three minutes. So that's what I hope to have achieved there. High aspirations of course. Um, yeah, I did talk you through my five points, that being maps, races of both uh, your team and your opponent's team, transitions, and extremely importantly, mobility of your units. So yeah, I have been Nova SC. Have a good day! See you later!